I'm Nick Ravellis, the host of UCSD TV's Opera Talk and the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. My passion is helping people understand opera and come to love it as much as I do. At San Diego Opera, my colleagues and I do that in many different ways, but one of my favorite events is the Artists' Roundtable. The San Diego Opera Artists' Roundtable is an intimate look at an exciting art form. I invite the principal artistic team for each production here to the Beverly Sills Salon for a freewheeling discussion before a live audience that covers everything from the music to the motivations of the characters to the director's stage vision and sometimes even a penetrating look at a singer's career. There is never a dull moment and it's one of the joys of my job that I get to moderate these discussions. I think you'll enjoy it too. Our very first production this year, of course, is Giacomo Puccini's La Boheme. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel of artists who are involved in this production. First of all, uh, directly on my right, making her debut with us, singing the role of Mimi, soprano Ellie Dean. Also making his debut with us, um, singing the role of Rodolfo, our tenor from Poland, Piotr Beczawa. Also from Pol no. Uh, <laughs> of course, from our own company, our resident conductor who will be conducting La Boheme, Karen Keltner. Yay. <laughs> and delighted to see her back for her 35th production. <laughs> 40, 46th and a half production. <laughs> and uh, next to her, uh, I'm, I'm proud because I was her boss at one point uh, in the San Diego Opera Ensemble, uh, and we're delighted to have her singing a principal role in La Boheme, and that is the soprano singing Musetta Pritigandi. Yeah. And also making a debut of sorts, although she was, she has been with us as an assistant director in past seasons, uh, but making her debut as principal stage conductor, uh, Lauren Meeker. <laughs> principal stage director, Lauren Meeker. We've got two conductors for La Boheme. Such a difficult score. <laughs> Sorry about it. So she's our stage director, of course. And then uh, at the end of the table, uh, coming back, I, th I believe the last time he was here, it was uh, 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 Valentin? In no, the last time was Carmen. I was, was in Carmen, Don Caire. Yes. Uh, our baritone singing the role of Marcello uh, is Jeff Matzi. Yeah. So again, you know, I've been, <laughs> I keep looking for new angles about La Boheme, and, and uh, I told Karen in an interview that will be um, uh, airing this Saturday morning, by the way, on Excellency One on San Diego Opera Matters that this time around, I, dis I rediscovered Bohème in the Bohemians themselves. And in Act One, you are immediately transported to this little garret uh, in Paris in the 1840s or 50s, uh, and you fall in love with these characters. But what finally dawned on me is that the opera is not just about the love between Mimi and Rodolfo, these two young lovers, it is also about the love of this community, of this family of, of uh, men and women who are artists, poets, philosophers, musicians, eking out a living, these bohemians uh, in mid-19th century Paris. I'd like to turn to Lauren, our director, um, just to, to, to address that a little bit. What is it, and not about the music and not about the script, but just about the way these characters are built, and we've got to uh, um, honor the librettists, really, the poets who wrote the text and the script for this and thank them for that, and perhaps Henri Muget, who wrote the original Absolutely. book. Absolutely. But what is it about these characters that makes us just fall in love with them as soon as we meet them? I think it's that there's something about these characters that every one of us can recognize 
you can see your brother or your sister or your uncle or someone that you went to school with or a neighbor. And that extends to the Mimi and the Rodolfo, the Marcello, the Musetta, but it goes way beyond that as well. It goes to the Colline and the Chenard. It goes to all of the vendors uh, on the street in Act Two, to all of the crowd members, to the grisettes who are out having a good time. I think there's so many characters that are uh, people we know or a, a large characterization of people that we know. And they have real emotion in this. There are emotions that we can recognize, whether it's uh, falling in love or the joy of Christmas Eve or falling out of love <laughs> and the pains of that, whether it's a fiery relationship or um, a more tempered one. I really think that, it's, that each and every one of us can recognize something different in the piece in a different character that we can connect to. Mm -hmm. And it's genuine relationships that are brilliantly written. And I think you're right to go back to the scenes de la vie de Bohème and where the text is based all the way through the work that Puccini and his librettists did. They're very careful with their characterization. Well, and, and the original Muget story mm -hmm. literally is scenes. It is not a plotted novel. Correct. It, there's, no, there's no plot, really. It's just a collection of scenes and vignettes. Right, as is the opera, really. It's four acts that are each a snapshot of these people's lives. So there's missing time in between, well, act one to act two is connected, but then between act two and act three, and again between act three and act four, we don't get to see those characters live. We open onto a picture, a slice of their life, and we get to enjoy it and view that one moment, that one picture with them, that one act with them, and then have, have a break and then see where they are when we get back. So it's sort of like a beautiful little treat of someone's mm. life that we get in each of the acts. Well, and, and I, I think that Puccini worked very, very hard with his librettists, and like any of the great composers, challenging them constantly to come up with something real Right. Uh, that, that he could resonate with. I like the way Puccini often begins his operas in the middle of a conversation, and this is, a, this is a typical yep. uh, yeah. example of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just amazing. Well, and I think that collaboration is pretty essential to the piece as well, and I'm going to bleed into Karen and the cast's territory here, but because the music and the text and the characters all blend so well together, because the research seems to indicate that Puccini and the librettist fought and tore over what should be in, what should be out, making up scenes, which scenes do we take, which do we leave out, they were very careful about putting together characters that would instantly, I think, spring to life mm -hmm. and speak in a very natural way to all of us. Mm -hmm. Karen, as, as conductor and as somebody who's, you've conducted Bohem, a number of times, um, and so you're obviously very familiar with it, but I think you have a great love for it as well, because we've spoken about how much, you, how it's close favorite this, Puccini, this I piece is. To <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just such a great piece. Um, what is it about the music, then, that carries these characters? Are the characters' musics, if there's such a word, different slightly? Um, oh, yes. I, I think that's one of the genius moments, or, uh, the conglomeration of moments that unfold as the score of, of La Boheme. I think one of the things in this particular score that Puccini, Puccini does so marvelously is infuse an amazing rhythmic energy mm -hmm. into the piece. And often that energy, not that anybody cares or should, is centered on a, a triplet figure, which often moves things along. Ba -bum 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 starts that way. Mm -hmm. But if you look at any of the other characters, or you, we talk about entering a conversation, mm -hmm. he enters a phrase sometimes with a snippet of something that either was or that he's just invented to take us another place. Oh, Buzetta comes in on a triplet. Exactly. So that <clears throat> creates a, a very youthful energy, mm -hmm. which of course this opera is, 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 is about youth, and I loved your comment about community. I think these days we're very aware of community, and not just the community of family, but the community of those we choose as family. And I, let me just put in a plug here. I haven't had this much fun for a very long time <laughs> with a group of people yeah. who are really 
caring about each other. And it just, every so often, chemistry happens, and this is one of those happenings. Of mm. course, it, it takes great casting. I think our artistic director is out there somewhere, <laughs> so bravo. Thank you, Ian. But um, <laughs> even with great casting, sometimes it's, that, that germ isn't there, but this is, this is fun to be around. It's fun to be involved in, and you couldn't have a better group of people to infuse the score with the energy that's contained here and make it live on the stage. Well, let's yeah. ask the singers about, th about this. Uh, uh, <laughs> Ellie, let's start with you. Are you having fun? Yeah, I, hope, I hope, Ellie, I'm I'll pay you well. <laughs> I'm having a great time, yes, in San Diego. It's minus the weather in the past few days. Yes. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Yes. Been a little wa rainy. Um, now, you're approaching Mimi as a newbie, in a, in a, in a sense. Yes. And so, um, how do you see the character of Mimi? How are you approaching her? Well, actually, I'm fortunate because I, I can bring kind of a fresh um, view onto me because for me it's new. So everything that, um, except for Priti, uh, everyone's done this show multiple times before. So I get to already have those Insta relationships that have been created. And um, I, I just get to go into this Insta family, like Karen was saying as well, and um, it, it, for me, I, I can make those split-second decisions, you know, and, and find out who she is as we go through the staging yeah. process, because it is already so comfortable. What are the challenges of the role vocally for you? Um, well, it, it's a, it sits vocally a little bit lower than um, the other roles that I've sung, but it, it's written in such a way that it's so beautiful, you just, you want to sing and, and sing that line. It, mm -hmm. So it's now, I've heard, and, and maybe Karen, you can sort of uh, come in on this as well. I've heard that occasionally Puccini uh, uh, has a tendency to cover the middle voice uh, with, with orchestration that may be a little too heavy. Do you, do you have to be careful? Oh, balancing? I think in any Puccini score, a conductor has to be careful because um, the line is very fine. The orchestra is, we have all our principal singers up here principal characters. The orchestra is the other character yeah. in the opera. So it has its own persona, uh, which comes in and out. You know, it's a through composed piece, meaning that this is not a piece of arias, duets, recitatives, but one moment flows from one into the other. And so the orchestra is a very vital part of that vitality and that pacing, but it is very heavily scored. So. By saying that, I mean that many times a vocal line is doubled by an instrument or instruments. And in certain crucial places, those players, I, in relation to those players in the stage, we need to be very cognizant of the balance that's happening. But I think that's the responsibility of a conductor in any opera. Sure. I really do. It is um, genius writing because of its transparency and because it's vi of its vitality, but we have to always, um, what shall I say, be very careful with our enthusiasm in the places where we're all together. Mm -hmm. So I would agree with you, but I think without it, it's not, without an orchestra, Bohem isn't Bohem. So I'm <laughs> eager, tomorrow is our first reading actually, and this is um, uh, it's the San Diego Symphony, so you've heard them and you know they play beautifully. However, they're a very young orchestra and many of the people in that orchestra have not played opera a lot. And certainly, Puccini presents even more challenges in that there is no one bar that's the same. So we have a lot of joyous work ahead of us, mm -hmm. but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Piotr, um, I'd like to talk to you about Rodolfo. Now, you've done the role of Rodolfo a number of times. Yes. So as opposed to Ellie, um, do you look for something fresh every time you you approach the role and or at every performance perhaps? Yes, yes, that's, uh, that's the idea. Uh, every evening we, we're looking for, find something fresh in the, in the, in the performance and uh, it's happened between us, between uh, solists on the stage and conductor, orchestra and people, uh, the sitting audience. And it is, especially by um, operas like Bohem, there's really, uh, it's everybody's talk about this, uh, really a couple of young people on the stage, and a couple of old people too. <laughs> 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 but uh, it is 
community opera. We are never alone on the stage. It's never, you know, some scene with somebody singing just for, for himself. It's, it's an ensemble uh, music and uh, it's very good support by orchestra and also mm, many times orchestra, um, Puccini in the orchestration, he described the character of the, of the person. You can hear, for example, the, 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 the couple of uh, bars before the entrance of Rodolfo. It's, it's very typical and it's just mm -hmm. described this character, how, how is the young man? And the same thing is by, by Mimi, the same thing is by entrance of, of uh, uh, Musetta. It's, uh, it's a small trick uh, to, to give the public the possibility to, to, to take the, the attention, the attention of, of, of what's happening next, who, who is coming on the stage, without reading the whole story and, and, and the comments and, and, and these things. And uh, I said that I think maybe this is my fourth or fifth uh, production of Bohème. And I was very happy to make the, all of them was very, very nice and, and mm -hmm. beautiful and with uh, beautiful costumes. And this he helps very, very much mm -hmm. to, to, to feel this uh, scenery, this uh, character of the opera and character of the, of, the, of the person what I have to play. It's very important, mm. I think. Uh, Jeff, you do not have an aria in this opera. No. You have a gorgeous <laughs> duet at the top of Act four, of Act 4 with Rodolfo that is, has quickly become my favorite moment in the opera. But you really are an ensemble player all the way through this opera. It's, he's everybody's best friend. Mm. He's sort of the centering factor of the entire thing. He's the one that when, when it's time to pay the rent, who does Benoit go to? He goes right to Marcello. Mm -hmm. He doesn't go to the other guys. The other guys kind of, you know, because he knows that he's the grounding one, he's the one that's in charge, he's the one that's kind of in control. And yet, he controls everything, but the only thing in this opera he can't control is Musetta. Yeah. And that's the thing that drives him crazy throughout the entire thing. And she comes back and everything's fine, and then he starts to try to control her again, and she won't have it, and they split up and go their ways again, and a couple of months down the road they get back together. Again, it's one of those relationships that just keeps boiling and bubbling and going on. But uh, he, it's his position to be the one that listens to everybody's problems. Mm -hmm. That's what makes the third act such a great act to sing as Marcello, is that he, first he deals with Mimi, finds out what's going on between her and Rodolfo, then Rodolfo comes out and unloads on him. And he tries to be the one that gives him this great advice saying it's okay, you know, Musetta and I are happy because we sing, you know, life and love just kind of has this variable, goes on and on. And then she starts flirting with somebody inside the tavern and he gets mad <laughs> and goes in and, and you see that he's just as, as real as anybody else, that he's, you know, just trying to get by as a, with, with the fun of everything. Yeah. Um, I was hoping Piotr didn't mean that I was one of the old ones on stage. <laughs> <laughs> just, well, I, I, was, I, just, I think back, the first time I sang this was 24 years ago. So it was, and, oh, and, dear. And Karen and we I actually did, did it at City Opera City several Opera. years back. Yeah. So it was, oh it's, it's, been, it's been a part of my existence for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, I've seen, gone from no children to two children. Now I have four children. So, <laughs> and I won't have any more, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, is it Bohem? This is, yeah. It's just Bohem. I got my four, my four characters going. So yeah. it's... Uh, but it's just sort of, you know, everybody just loves the friendships. And that's why I think everybody in the first act, when the four guys get together and start having the fun, that it pulls you into the story so that everyone, you have to like these characters at the beginning to then feel anything at the end. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't like them, if you don't sort of bond with them from the get-go, then you failed somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting, too, in Act 4, how everything turns on a dime in an instant musically uh, and uh, in, in terms of their conversation, the dialogue, what they're doing, the action, mm -hmm. Musetta bursts in, and the whole uh, feel of the piece, the whole atmosphere of the piece changes immediately. It's almost cinematic, isn't it? It's, it's mm -hmm. rather like a film, just yeah. sort of interesting. Rather like life. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah exactly. Preeti. We have uh, 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 our Musetta here. Tell us a little bit about Musetta and how you're approaching her for the first time, which is exciting. Yes, I'm first sure time. For you. Yeah. Well, first I wanted to say that Jeff is going to remedy Marcella's absence of an aria by singing Quando a couple of performances. <laughs> so <laughs> we've, we've taken Thank care you. of that. 
Um, this is my first time singing Musetta, and actually one of my first times singing a uh, legitimate soprano role. And so it's been kind of um, a discovery all around for me in terms of the character and the tessitura vocally and um, just having a bigger part of the story. So I've, every day I'm learning 10,000 things. <laughs> and um, it's been a lot of fun to discover the character of Musetta because as I've told some people, her character was, isn't something that, that I naturally am. And discovering her character has helped to wake up those parts of me and apply them and, and understand her character better because I've had to live in her skin a little bit. And um, that's, been, that's been a real discovery. Mm -hmm. Now, as a former mezzo, yes. or, or someone making that transition, uh, does, is the role high for you? Do you feel that it, the tessitura is a little high, or does well, it feel just right? Or? It's interesting, because every act actually has a different flavor in terms of the tessitura. Mm -hmm. um, act two, when she comes in, a lot of those lines are very spontaneous and very quick and very high. And then they kind of sit there, and she kind of just keeps singing up there because she has a lot to say, and it's very loud. <laughs> <laughs> and she wants people to hear her. So negotiating that was um, a real, you know, challenge for me as a former mezzo. But obviously, I've been working on it for the last couple of years in terms of the tessitura change. And then when I come into um, Act Three, that quartet, she's kind of all over the place because mm -hmm. it's a fight. And so vocally, it reflects that by she's singing in the middle and she pops up to high. And so I really actually enjoy that kind of singing. And then in Act 4, she's much more in mezzo territory, where I'm much more familiar with. And I was thinking while you were talking about the um, orchestration covering up the middle range a lot of the time, I was thinking in Act 4, actually, I think the orchestration is light over Musetta because it's, more, it's as recit-like as you can get. It's much more speaky. And the prayer is very light orchestration. And I think it's because it's more like recit rather than aria singing mm -hmm. in act four. So um, for me, it's kind of um, a journey from high to all over the place to low as the opera goes on. So I have to come in with a lot of energy right off the bat. Yeah. It's sort of interesting, as, as you were talking, noticing and, and thinking about Bohem being really a conversational opera. There's a lot of <coughs> di mundane dialogue, I guess is what you would call it, that in an earlier time would be treated as a recitative, but that he treats so melodically, mm -hmm. particularly in act one, right. you never feel like you're ever away from a true melody, and yet they're saying things like, oh, this damn stove won't work, and we've right. got to tear right. this up and throw it in, and you know, it, it, yeah. let's go to the party. I mean, it, um, even the end yeah. of the two, two, big, two big areas of yep. uh, Mimi oh, and Rodolfo yeah. is actually a part of, 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 a, of a discussion of, yeah. of a, some, some scene, you know, you answer me and, and it's really a small uh, conversation between two, two, two yeah. people. With an interlude of gorgeous Italian lines. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, right. But no, I, I was just going to say that, that the end of your aria as Mimi ends very conversationally. Yep, it's right. parlando. Yeah. It's, yep. right. It could not be more conversationally. Yeah. Yeah. And is it, is it difficult to shift from one lyrical style to a more conversational style? Or is, has Puccini written it so well that you know, it just works? I mean, I think he's written it very well. And our, our first little duet where he, I need my candle lit, it's, it's delightful in the way that it was written. I mean, you just fall in love with both of the characters. And then when we do introduce ourselves in, in the arias, the lyrics themselves aren't always, Mimi's get very poetic. Uh, during her swelling uh, legato line. April's but, first kiss right, and all that. Right, and that's yeah, yeah. very romantic and very poetic and languid. Um, but the other actual, you know, what she's saying is just kind of trying to think of what to say and, you know, stuttering over her words and chatter, really. For the, and that's kind of what makes it charming, is that mm -hmm. she does finally open up and, and you can see her real soul, mm -hmm. the real joy of the mm -hmm. music. I actually think of Rodolfo's aria be, as being more poetic in terms of text. No, the Rodolfo is not so good poet than Mimi. <laughs> <laughs> she, she is the really poet in, the, in, in this opera. Uh, he tried to write something, but it's, uh, he knows it's not very good, probably, because you know, he burned her own work yeah. in the first scene. You know, that <laughs> means something. Okay. Uh, I, of course, it's a big aria, you know, but the aria is, starts also from a dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, Kajelida Manina, and you know, ask, uh, wait, don't go. I explain you something. I tell you about me, and, and that's that's really a not 
this big area like, I don't know, uh, other areas of Puccini. They are more uh, mm, for, the, for the singer alone. For it's like monologue. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is this whole scene in the first act is so beautiful written. It's, it's, it's uh, really shows the very, very mm, high quality of, of, of the composer. Because he, he has an imma immense uh, sense of, of uh, dramatur I don't know, dramaturgy. How to say Drama it? Dramaturgy. Drama mm -hmm. Dramaturgy. Yeah. And it's the small words for them. And it's not, not even a whole line sometimes. It's just one word, two words. It's so interesting, include in the line of orchestra. And it's just, just a lot of fun to make it. Because mm. it's, it's so truly music. It's uh, not something what is, uh, you know, we tell, tell in Poland, you know, taking from the notes, you know, like it's mm. just constru construction. It's just really coming from the heart and, and, it, and it's very easy to sing. It's really, it's coming from the, from the, from the bottom of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, Lauren, as someone in, in theater, I think you probably appreciate uh, as much as anyone that Puccini was a man of the theater. Absolutely. He really knew what worked and what didn't, don't yeah. you think? Are I there think, any yeah. places in this opera where you feel like you need to make up for something that's no, weak? Absolutely in the not. No, I think this is a <coughs> gift as a director to be able to work on a piece like this for a number of reasons. Because, as we've already said, the characters are so fleshed out and so recognizable. Because the music matches that characterization or enhances it, gives us more information. It's also one of the um, few operas Britain is really good at it as well, where you can actually read the libretto as a play, as text, and it reads conversationally, almost like a straight theater piece would. Um, so it has, it's innately uh, developed this natural conversational style, even within the arias that you've, that you've talked about. I mean, I'm sure we've all been around someone who's gotten lost in thought when they're talking about something that they really love. It's as simple as that. It's mm. as simple as having a, a normal conversation with somebody else and describing to someone for the first time who you are and, and what you love. So for a director, it actually makes it really easy. Mm. Plus when you have a cast that's uh, full of rock stars like we have here, <laughs> it makes it even easier. Um, because we get to play, and really, that's why I got into theater in the first place, was because I got to play all day long, uh, in the best sense of the word. And here we have phenomenal music and phenomenal text and phenomenal singers, a phenomenal conductor, a phenomenal everything. <laughs> and we just get to bring it all together over the course of the rehearsal process and then enjoy it with all of you. I'd like to open it up to all of you, perhaps, to answer, or as many of you who wish to, uh, because this will be um, uploaded to YouTube. Uh, we will not only have an audience of people who know Bohème and love Bohème or love opera, mm -hmm. who perhaps have not seen Bohème, um, which is very different, I think, from someone who has never seen an opera before, but Bohème, I think we would mostly agree, is the one to see. Mm -hmm. Why? What is it about Bohème that would, that would lead you to tell someone who's never seen an opera that this would be a good opera to start with? I have a thought about that, which sort of goes back to your initial question about the characters. I also think the story is written about people in that spark time of their life that everyone, all of us can look back to as a moment that we remember fondly, or if we're young, that we can look forward to. And it's that time in your life when you're biting for, some, for life to happen, you're, you're waiting f to fall in love, you're carefree, you're artistic, you have big dreams. And I think we've all been there, or we're all looking forward to going there oh, I'm at doing some it point. Now. Oh, I'm except doing for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and we get to see these people live in that moment, that moment that's in each of our heads, I think, that's in our dreams. We get to see them go through it. And we get, to see, we get to see us spark right into it, and it crashes by the end of Act Four, and we realize that a new phase of life has begun. Mm -hmm. And for me, th that's why it's exciting for me, because I get to see a real life moment of all that joy, all that artistic fun that all of us so desperately want, and to see it change on the turn of a dime as well. It's also the, it's the living humanity of the piece. That's all. It's just that the, the characters are so human, 
And I always tell young people that if they're going to go see it, I said, look, you know what it's like you're heading off to college. Mm -hmm. You know what it's like you're going to have to live in, in a dorm or in a, in a frat house or in a sorority house, and you're going to have friends. And some of you may have more money than others. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes, you know, you have to get along. So you've got four guys sharing an apartment. They can't really pay their rent, but try <laughs> to pay their rent. You know, they, they're eating ramen noodles. Yep. You know, and, and trying to, to yeah. get a couple, you know, a couple liters of Diet Coke, and, but they always have money to go out and get drinks. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's that sort of thing that connects to people in general. Yep. You know, I lived with a French family uh, uh, years ago as a, as a student, and then and, and I adopted as mine this family. And so I had a, a French brother, I still do actually, uh, Jean-Yves. And on subsequent trips to France, I would often stay in Jean-Yves' apartment in Paris. And if you think what these guys are living when you see that first act is a figment of anybody's Im imagination, it's not. Uh. Jean-Yves lived like that. There was, you know, there could be a shoe on the table, but there was always wine. Yep. Not very good wine, but there was always wine. Um, the kitchen was a mess most of the time. So when I would go and kind of crash there in between planes and going somewhere, I'd find myself doing a little straight, but it, it is that, Jeff. It is what is real, and yeah. whether we've lived it ourselves, or whether we're going to live it, or whether we recognize it in others, it's, it's, it, it just speaks to every single person. It cannot help but speak to every one of us. Hmm. Anyone else like to say? You know, uh, it speaks to everybody, but you know, it speaks for people that are sensitive. That's, that's the really one rule. And, and people like this go into the opera. And it's one thing could kill the story. Uh, maybe I repeat myself. <laughs> but uh, when you have a, a very modern, cracky production, <laughs> uh, even, even this music can, can help. And yeah. if somebody going, to this opera, uh, uh, and it's, he'll be her first opera. Maybe he will be never come back in the opera house. But it's that's very, very, very important. And it's not just music, not just what you hear, it's just what you, also what you, what you see and, and how it speaks to you. And it's very, very important because opera is really a very, very complex uh, uh, art. And, and we never should forget how complex it is. I don't think I'm aware of any really crazy production of La Boheme. <laughs> would you, would you describe that you spent too much time in America? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> Maybe so. Lucky you. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a lucky person because I never saw a really horrible production of this, of this opera. But I saw a couple of, and uh, it could be really, really, really bad. <laughs> and you spend three and a half hours as public to, to try to understand what's going on, <laughs> why, and, 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 and who, with, you know, and you, you see people that are doing things that are nothing to do with Bohem from Puccini. And, and I agree with, with the directors, they, they do something like this, but they have to change the, 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 the title of the opera, you know, something other, but not Bohème from Puccini, because <laughs> the composer was smart enough to, to, to make, he was a genius, not somebody who tried to reproduce something completely different. And, you know, it's, uh, it's not just Bohème, really, it's not just Bohème, but it's a, there's a, Bohème, I think, it's, it's a special opera. Mm. You can't really, do something wrong there. If, you, if yeah. you read the music, if you try to, to describe the character and put it on the stage, you land it in, you know, it's, it's just very easy. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not, not easy for everybody. Yeah, well there are some operas that are so identified with their time and place that to fool with them in any way seems you, you do it at your peril. I just, I, I guess I'm naive enough to think that no one would do that to Bohem, but I guess they do. Well, I, I, uh, I would <laughs> say that I performed once, I did a Schonard in Pittsburgh several years ago, where it was updated to 1990s. 
and um, it was with Craig Siriani and Barbara Frittoli and uh, also Kevin Glavin and several other singers. Anyway, it was, I played Schonard and I came in and I was making my living as a classical musician, so I came in dressed in a tuxedo and I proceeded to strip down to my boxer shorts and change into leather pants and pull my hair out, so I had this long hair and I made, I wanted to be a rock performer, <laughs> but I couldn't make money as a rock artist. At the end of the second act, Musetta and Marcello left on a motorcycle <laughs> with full, I mean, they drove off, <laughs> you know, the whole sound taking off on the motorcycle. In the middle of the score. In the middle of the score, yeah. at the very oh. end. And, and there was a, a, a <laughs> continual fog on stage. The director thought that it's Paris, it's winter, there's always fog. <laughs> so by the end of, by the, by the fourth act, Craig Sirian's like, I can't sing anymore, get this <laughs> fog out of here. So it was, I mean, that was probably the most updated, bizarre, and, and somebody said, yeah. If you're freezing cold, why were you in your boxer shorts? Yeah. <laughs> Ask the director. <laughs> and, and the answer is, trust me, it will be great. That's it. It will be great. Um, I want to I shift the conversation slightly away from Bohem because we have um, young singers here. You notice, Jeff, I said we have young singers yes. here. And, uh, I am young. <laughs> you are, indeed, uh, singing young characters in, in uh, this wonderful opera. Um, and I think there are also young singers who will be watching this and who are here in the audience. And uh, from a young singer's perspective, uh, what is the best advice that you can give to a singer today who's perhaps in his or her early 20s, maybe they're just finishing college and they're thinking about an opera career, what is the best advice that you can give that young singer? Ellie, I'll start with you. That's a tough one. Um, I, honestly, I think trust your gut. I think you know what feels good to sing, and you know you have to take certain risks, but um, you know the, everybody has an opinion, and everybody thinks your voice is going to do something different. And I think you really have to listen to yourself about what you know you are capable of and what you really should. You can say no, <laughs> and it, it actually won't be career ending. And, yeah. and that's, that was a very important lesson to me. Is you, I, you know that's what a your limits are. really important piece of advice, because you, you know yourself more than anybody else. And to say no is a really important thing to learn in any walk of life. Preeti, how about you? Well, I fully agree with Ellie. That's really great advice, learning to say no. That's always tough when you're a singer coming out of college and you want jobs and you need to pay your bills and you want to get paid, you want experience. Saying no to a gig that might not be right for your voice. At the moment, you think, oh, no, I could do it. You know, it's fine, I could do it. And then, you know, three years later, you're paying for it vocally and, you know, it's, it's not what you want on your resume. It isn't the direction that you wanted to go. So I absolutely agree with Ellie. Also, it's, it's a really tough career. <laughs> There's a lot of ups and downs and there are times without work and there are times with a lot of work and there are times when you have the, the craziest temp jobs you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I think sticking, sticking to it and having hope, surrounding yourself with a really good support system of people who are always encouraging the best of you. I think that has probably saved me through some of those times when I'm thinking, why am I doing this? I should just get a regular job and then I can pay my bills on a normal basis. But I think that getting a really strong support system is what I would say has probably saved me through mm. some really roller coaster times of people who will encourage you and remind you that you have done it and you can do it and that you will continue to do it. And um, yeah, that's what I would say. Piotr. It's, it's everything actually that my colleagues told. It's one, one thing more. Uh, the young people have to know to be patient in this mm. kind of, of, of um, work. Because uh, we're working with, with, the, with the body. Voice is connected with the body and you, you can't build, uh, you know, Schwarzenegger was also, you know, not built in two years right. from, from uh, you know, 60 kilo guy. It's not possible without tricks. You know, right. you can do many, many things with the tricks, but to be honest with yourself and with your voice, with your, with your body, with your, with your mind also, it's, it's very important. And uh, what Pretty told, it's, uh, they have to know it is really hard job. 
it's not just glamour and, and, and nice uh, couple of hours at the evening and nice applause. Mm. It's really hard, hard job. And, and uh, they have to learn to enjoy it, this hard working. Mm -hmm. Because without that, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. Mm. Jeff? Oh, Can I'm I sorry. just say one yeah. more thing uh, in, along that same vein? It's very important to like to be alone because you are in hotel rooms all over the world by yourself. And, you know, we happen to have a great cast, but, you know, sometimes people have their own lives and they go home. And at the end of the day, you really are by yourself. And uh, you have to feel really comfortable with where you're at. Mm. Play golf. <laughs> 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 Jeff. I, I, the one thing that I had a teacher tell me when I first started was, she said, don't be drawn by the money, learn to sing, solidify your technique, and if you sing well, the money will come afterwards. Mm -hmm. Don't be drawn by the fact that you have to make a job, you have to do this job or that job, get paid, even though it's outside of what your technique w will carry for you. So be, trust your voice, trust the physical makeup of your voice, and learn to sing first. And, and the other big thing to do is to learn to keep your mouth shut. Mm. Because you, if you have a complaint about anything in your business, you go home and you tell it to your significant other, mm. you tell it to the wall, because you never know it may end up getting back to somebody. Because the, the first, I learned that on the very first job that I ever did was that there were some people that complained about the, the entire makeup of the, the situation and it was with uh, Pavarotti, he was in charge, and it got back to him. And we were flying from Philadelphia to Modena, Italy, and the day after we were supposed to leave in the morning, five people got a phone call saying, you don't have to come with us. Ooh. So the most important thing is just to remember, to be thankful for the opportunities you're given, mm -hmm. and always if you have a problem, there's someone you can tell that you can trust with everything. And that's where you go. And then you go back to work and you smile and you just do your job. <laughs> Very good advice. Very good advice. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience. So let me move out there for a moment. Puccini's operas, his biggest hits particularly, are centered on a woman or women, not males. So I think it's uh, something to consider when you're thinking about Puccini, that women are the most important. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, if you, if you look at all his operas, it's true. He connected with one single female character on, on the piece, with whether it be Tosca, whether it be uh, Boheme. Specifically, if you think of Turandot, when Liu dies, he didn't know how to finish the opera. He had, and that's why it was left, and when he passed away, that's why we have all the people trying to put it together. But when Liu passes away, it, it, the whole thing changes, and you can't connect with that, because Turandot is not the one you connect with, it's Liu in, that, in, in Turandot. Any other questions? I actually, I, I have yeah. one other. Um, when you sing a really great phrase <laughs> in an aria, uh, or in a duet, I mean, oh, oh my God, Marcello has some great, great phrases in that duet I was talking about earlier. This is a weird question, I suppose, but how do you feel physically when that happens correctly, when it, when it really connects, when it really works? What is the feeling that you get? I've often, I, I, it, it, I guess it seems like a strange question, but uh, because I want you to really think inside yourself. But what does that feel? That must be such a rush. But I don't want to put a word words in your mouth, Ellie. It is. It, it's adrenaline, and it's uh, maybe a sigh of relief, depending on the role. But um, no, it's, it's actually it, it. It feels like you ran a mile, and you have that rush of adrenaline. It just feels good and electric, and yeah, there's nothing better. Some, sometimes after after this phrase, you re, you, you realize oh, it's something great happened, and you are on the, on very high level, electric level, and this can happen after. You have to find the way to 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 to, to sing uh, uh, mm -hmm. the role, you know, yeah. the, rest the rest of, of that. <laughs> because it's uh, yeah. that's also a very very important uh, uh, technical thing that to learn how not to be exciting from your own yeah, singing. Right. 
Good point. Uh, <laughs> really, true. because because it's uh, you have to be exciting about our singing, and we just do it. We just make it happen. And uh, you know, I saw many many colleagues. They are so in love with with themselves that the, the <laughs> they completely uh, lost the, 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 the reality. And it's uh, it can happen. But you know, a great great phrase is you no. Know, it's it's really like 320 years drive, you know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not happen every, every every evening. Actually, athletes talk about being in the zone when they're in competition, and it, that was a good allegory because it's very much like being an athlete, isn't it? That when you sing a wonderful phrase or you have a few moments that you just hit it perfectly, it is like being in the zone, and it's a little bit of an out of body experience too sometimes because it almost feels like it, when it clicks in, it's singing itself. Would you agree? That's kind of the feeling. Yeah, and it's, it's not something that we can explain. It's sort of like, I mean, still going to the sports, if you remember um, years ago when Michael Jordan was in that playoff game and he kept hitting all those three-pointers, kept hitting, hitting and, and you see that one thing, he's going like this to the camera, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's right. working. <laughs> you know, and it's sort of like the singer. You get to the point where you do that and you hope that that's how it is. You know, and hope you don't, if you go for the note and you crack, you know, you don't want to, the only other way to say that is you feel like the San Diego Chargers field goal kicker. Oh. I, mean, that's, that's, I mean, you feel that terribly at that moment on that stage. So it's... Lauren, it's not terribly different in the quote-unquote straight theater world, right? No, not at all. When actors, when, 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 actors, uh, when the curtain comes down, yep. they have that same feeling, I think, if there's been a great connection with the audience. Yeah, absolutely, and that's... I, I think opera is just another layer and another extension of being a straight theater actor. You just happen to be singing uh, everything that you're saying instead of speaking. It's the same development of a character. You happen to have music underneath you that's given to you by a composer as opposed to in a straight uh, theater play where you would get to sort of create your own timing and your own rhythm. But when you're tuned in, when you're an actor, which is what all of these people are, they're actors as much as they're singers then you're creating a, another life on stage. Um, it's another world that we enter uh, you know, for however long, three and a half hours. Um, and then there's a, a joyous moment with audience and, uh, and cast, and then you go back to being you. Mm. Yeah. But the, and the level of complexity about which you just spoke is, is something to be considered too, because when um, we hit what I think of sometimes, I don't think of it, but when it happens, it's, it's in the groove. Everything, all of those levels, the singing, which is extensive and ex excruciatingly beautiful, the props are working, the, the chorus is working, the orchestra, when we hit the moment where all of those gears are absolutely in line, there is nothing like it in the world. And that's what touches you, whether we explain what it is or not. And those moments are very dangerous too because if we stop, I know as a conductor, if, if you stop to, to luxuriate at all in them, it's a prime <laughs> moment for, <laughs> yes. no, but I don't mean stop to conduct, but even if you start to, it's Recognize just like it. you. Yeah it's a perfect moment for something to happen, not mm. good. So it's this fine line you walk, and it's, it, it's, a, it's like a, I don't know, I haven't taken them, but I imagine it must be like the highest high of a drug, which is why we're all in this business, because yep. when it happens, you can't help but try to, to have that same feeling again. I'm, I'm thinking uh, when I was staying in, New, when I was living in New York, uh, went to a recital of the great concert pianist Claudio Rao, who um, the best way you can, you can describe his playing is that it was in the, the German word innig, you know, it was very interior, it was just so soulful. And saw him at Avery Fisher Hall playing the, the Liszt B minor piano sonata, and it's just one of those pieces that has so many moments like that when you can just sort of let yourself get lost. And there are these great phrases that, you know, when you play them, the audience really connects with you. Poor man, let that happen. Oh, you mean? He let that happen, and he got lost. 
Yeah. Just and, and every pianist in the room, <laughs> our stomachs just dropped. You know, it was such a frightening moment because we all knew how complex that score is and how you have to find your way back. Well, he just skipped three pages and went to the fugue, if you know, if you know the piece, and started the fugue and just kept going. But That's easy when you're alone on the stage. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and that, was the, that was the greater point. You can't let that happen in opera. Right. That, you, because there's no coming back. <laughs> the, the orchestra keeps going. Everybody else keeps going. If you're lost, forget it. Yeah, so you, you know, although I surely appreciate and understand what you're saying about what happens to you physically when, when, when you hit that moment, when that great phrase comes out and you don't know where it came from and the exhilaration, you do always have to bring yourself back. Right. Yeah. It's, and Rodolfo, at the end of the opera, you can't completely lose it. You can't really lose it, I guess, is what I'm saying. You have to... It is, it is, it is a part of, of, of absolute control because you have to sing what, what is in the score and you put your own emotion in, in, inside this but you have to be uh, like the other person one yard left exactly. to control all the time what's happening on the stage what, what you do what you have to do what, what the other is doing and it's, it's really a, a, a little bit of schizophrenic you know it's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. yeah. too yeah. D different person at the same time on the stage. Yeah. That's also the job, I think, of a storyteller. A good storyteller doesn't get involved and wrapped up in the story. We give that to you. So it's like we are an instrument, and it has to come through us and touch you. And if we stop to enjoy it or get wrapped up in it, it stops right here. Yeah. Well, thank you all very, very much. This is a, a scintillating discussion about Bohem, and uh, it really helps us to look even more forward to the production opening next week. Thank you. Thank you.